today. And if you got your Bibles, turn to Luke 24. Uh, that's where we're going to be. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we're so happy that you're here with us, and uh, we hope that you feel welcomed and uh, and encouraged and challenged. And, and uh, today, we're, we're just so thankful for each of you. Uh, just um, uh, just a couple quick announcements. Um, as uh, Tyler mentioned regarding camp forms, they're, they're going to be out there. You can catch those on the way out. Um, uh, next week, we're going to finish this series that, we're, that we've been in for several weeks now, uh, talking about uh, overcoming failure. And then we're beginning, uh, we're actually doing something we did six or seven years ago. It's going to be a church-wide, small group, intensive study. Uh, AHA, I'll be telling you more about that, but there's going to be there's sign-ups back there in the back on the table. We'd love for you. We want everybody to participate, uh, if possible. Uh, a Sunday school teacher was uh, asked her class on the Sunday before Easter if they knew what happened on Easter and why it was important. And uh, one little girl spoke up and said, well, Easter is when the whole family gets together and you eat turkey and you sing about pilgrims and all that. And the teacher said, no, 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 no that, that's not what it's about. And a uh, second student raised, raised their hand and said, I, I know what Easter is. Easter is when you get a tree and you decorate it and you give gifts to everybody and sing lots of songs. And, the teacher said, no, 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 that, that's not what Easter is all about either. Well, finally, a third student spoke up and said, well, Easter is when Jesus was killed and put in a tomb and left for three days. And the teacher said, thank goodness. Somebody finally knows, uh, you know, what, what Easter is all about. But then the student went on and said, then everybody gathers at the tomb to wait to see if Jesus comes out. And if he sees his shadow, he has to go back inside. <laughs> And we got six more weeks of winter. I forgot y'all were back there. Huh? <laughs> I forgot y'all. All right, so every so often I need to hear a little bit just to, just to remind me. Um, again, we are so happy that, that you are with us today. Uh, we have been studying, and, it, and typically what I do is when I preach, I uh, usually go through a, uh, a, a series that we sort of uh, study in. And we've been looking at the, the, all the times that Jesus is recorded eating with people. And when you start paying attention, Jesus is recorded in the Gospels eating a lot of meals. And uh, he, he liked to eat like, like many of us do, I think. And, and he ate with a variety of, of people. And, and Jesus gained a reputation really around these meals for eating with people and hanging out with people who are far from God. And so if you're here today and, uh, or, or you're watching online and you feel far from God, maybe even a little intimidated in a religious setting, uh, I got good news for you. Jesus loved being with people just like you. So today, uh, we're going to look at another meal. This meal is a little bit different, though. This one's unique because all the meals that we've looked at up to this point have been Jesus on, on this side of the cross, uh, this side of the resurrection. Today, we're going to look at another meal. And there'll actually be two meals in this one where Jesus uh, is eating after the resurrection. But this meal and this, the, the events around and before this meal are so important because it reminds us of today. It reminds us how the resurrection changes everything. And uh, we're going to see that. Luke 24, verse 1. Look what it says. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had pre prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them, uh, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? 
They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, here's our meal, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And, and, and why, do you, uh, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of the joy and amazement, he said, Do you have anything here to eat? Here's another meal. They gave him a piece of broad fish, and he ate it, and, and in the present, and he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what was, is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you to my father. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I normally don't read or preach from large sections of scripture like that, but I think it's entirely appropriate often just to let the word of God speak for itself. In fact, we could probably, we could wrap it up right now and it would be entirely appropriate, right? But I would miss out on all this fun, right? So we're just, just hang with me just a little bit longer. But if you've got your Bibles or if you've in your Bibles, if you're reading along there, <clears throat> if yours is outlined like mine, there's four sections there. But as I was reading through this and praying and looking through this, I kept noticing three words that sort of summarized each of these sections really well as I read them. But I think that the main point that's going to, that we're going to drive home today, I hope, and, and you got as we read that, again, is that the resurrection changes everything. Yeah. That the resurrection, like you and I, we're here today because of the resurrection. And, um, but, but what's so interesting is that, you, that we also, we've experienced, like this passage is so important because we experience all these same emotions. All these emotions that they were experiencing that day. And so in the beginning, the, these, the, the text, we have women going to the tomb on Sunday morning. Jesus had been crucified a few days earlier. And because of the Sabbath and, and preparation for the Passover, they weren't able to fully prepared the body for burial. And so the women are coming back to finish what they began. They were fully expecting to find a dead body in the tomb. But the stone was rolled away. His body was missing. 
And instead, these two men, angels, appear to, appear to them and say, He is not here. He is risen. And those three words right there, right? Those three words are the most important words in our faith. If Jesus hasn't risen today, that makes him a fake, that makes him a fraud. If he hasn't risen, like we're wasting our time here. If he hasn't risen, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we're still in our sins. But he is risen, amen? amen? Praise God for that. And so the women, they rush back and they tell the men what they discovered. But did you catch what they said? Their words seemed like nonsense. Their words seemed like nonsense. Maybe that's your story today. Maybe you can't really get on board with Christianity because it just seems like nonsense. I mean, here we are. We're living in 2023. That's what our, our ancestors believe. That's what our grandparents and our great-grandparents believe. You, you want me to believe in a God that I can't see? You want me to believe in this, this man that was supposedly resurrected some 2,000 years ago? It seems like nonsense. And if that's you, I, I understand. In fact, I think one of the things that we learn from this narrative is that belief's not always easy. Belief isn't always easy. These apostles, they had doubts. Uh, these two men on the road to Emmaus, they, they had doubt. We read elsewhere where Thomas says famously, like, unless I see his hand, like, unless I touch him, and like, I, I, I'm not going to believe. And so I understand that belief sometimes can be difficult. I... I, I uh, I understand that, right? I, I, I don't know. Sure, listen, this morning, like, I, I've got a friend I've, I've shared with you. We've been praying for him, 46 years old, seemingly healthy, uh, church planner, uh, husband, father of three, had a stroke con several months ago, continues to stroke in so many ways. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know why a, a young, she was 25 years old, beautiful, brilliant, part of our youth ministry back in Kentucky, took her own life. I don't know why God heals some people and others aren't healed. I, I don't know why storms come through Mississippi and just happen to hit our building, right? Lord, I mean, is it me? You know, I, don't, I don't know, right? I, you know, I, I don't know. You know, we, uh, Christian school in, in Nashville gets, gets shot up. We, we all have questions that are difficult to answer. But here's what I know. I know when I was 17 years old. And I fully gave my life to Christ, repented of my sins. I, I haven't been the same since. Right. Here's what I know. I know that God guides my life. And when I get out of bounds and when sin occurs, I feel his discipline. I understand his correction. I know he's in my life. Here's what I know. When I pray, I can sense God's direction in, in my life for years and years. Many years ago, like I, I, I was convinced that God was going to like I was going to get a, a graduate degree in counseling and that this was probably what I was going to end up doing. And I went back and forth, back and forth. And I would always get right up to that point where I was ready to just kind of get get things rolling and jump in. But inevitably, it was always in the morning for whatever reason. I just read in Psalm 16 the, this morning just how God instructs us even as we sleep, which is fascinating to think about. But I, but I think this is what was happening. And every morning when I would wake up, uh, when I would get up to that point. I could feel God say, no, 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 no. Let's hit the brakes. That's not my plan. You're heading to Baldwin, Mississippi. You just don't even know it yet, right? It's coming. It's coming. Here's what I know. God continues to transform me. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was, right, or could be as well, right? I don't know a lot. I've got a lot of questions as well, but I know that I once was blind, but now I see. See, don't fail to get, like, don't walk away or fail to give Jesus a chance just because it seems like nonsense. Nothing could be further from the truth. And there's all kinds of things I could say this morning and point to, but just the very way this is written, the very narrative, the nature of this text, like, it helps you to understand that this wasn't just something that was made up. Do you know why? Because nobody in the first century would have women to be the first eyewitnesses. They just wouldn't do it. You know what? Rebecca McLaughlin says it like this. That would be like resting a vital legal claim today on the testimony of a few kids. There's no weight to it. Even just the text itself. It's not written like something, somebody just trying to make something up and pass it along. And so if this is you today and you've got some doubts, let's talk. I'd love to talk. Maybe some of the things that you're struggling with, like maybe that's not, they're not even, you know, I, I don't know. Let, let's, let's talk about it. That's the first thing. And then that next section, if we were to outline it, we go to the, to the road. These two men on the road of Emmaus. And they're leaving Jerusalem. 
right? And, and just think about all the things that had been happening over that weekend. Jesus was crucified. The town was buzzing. Everything that was happening. And these guys are walking along the road. And they're, they're, they're disappointed. They're discouraged. And Jesus comes walking along beside them. And they don't recognize him. And he says, hey, what y'all, what y'all talking about? And they're like, what do you mean what are we talking about? We're talking about what everybody's been talking about over these past few. Like, are you just a stranger? Are you new in town? What's going on? But as they, as they talk, their discouragement sinks in. And they stop walking. And they hang their head. And they say these three words. We had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one that was going to make everything right, but he's dead. And there was some women in our group, like they're making these claims about empty tombs and angels. But when others investigated, they didn't see Jesus. And as you read the text, like you can feel their disappointment. Their teaching, like Jesus' teaching had changed their lives. They, they thought for sure that he was the one that was going to come and redeem Israel, but a dead man can't redeem anything. They were living in Friday's defeat. Right? They were living in Friday's defeat. And their story, their story's been our story. Right? We, we've uttered those three words before, haven't we? We had hoped. We had hoped the scans were going to come back clear. We hoped that rehab would have worked this time. We had hoped that the depression was only temporary. We had hoped that the, the job would be permanent. And you've walked that Emmaus road. And it seems like Jesus was nowhere in sight. And yet he was right there. In this section, it reminds us that Jesus never lets us walk alone. He comes to us in those moments of our greatest disappointments. And we may not even recognize him because disappointment has a way of blinding us. But he's always, he's always there. After uh, Moses died, Joshua takes up leadership in his place. And he's discouraged. And God meets him on his road of fear and doubt. And God tells him, he says, no one's going to be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous. And then the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it applies that same promise to us believers today. That God will never uh, leave us or forsake us. Church, understand, we just sang about it in beautiful ways. That God didn't send his son in the world just to leave and then for us to be overcome by it. He, he told his disciples that in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world, meaning you will too. His victory became our victory. See, this is why the resurrection matters. And in that section of Hebrews where, where uh, the, the author is applying that promise to us that God will never leave us or forsake us, he goes on to say these words. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can mere mortals do to me? See, this, these guys on, on the road to Emmaus, they didn't know at this point what we know. See, from their perspective, Jesus was defeated. But in all reality, death had been defeated. In all reality, Satan had been defeated. See, he lost that battle the day that Jesus walked out of the tomb. See, I, I'm concerned, church, that for so many of us today, that we're still living in Friday's defeat instead of Sunday's victory. It, it, it took a seven-mile journey for these guys to finally see the Jesus that they were looking for, that he was walking beside them the whole way. And he's beside you as well today, right? He, he walks with you in your discouragement. He walks with you in your loss of employment. He walks with you in your financial chaos. He, he walks with you in your infertility. He walks with you in your marriage struggles. He walks with you in your recovery. He walks with you in your grief, in your loss, in your doubts. Jesus never lets us walk alone. Church, we've got to lift up our head, be reminded of this Easter Sunday. There's nothing that we're going through now or in the future that can take away our hope. What can man do to me? And as these men walk along the road with Jesus, look what verse 27 says. It said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. See, this is why you hear me say so often that all of scripture is pointing to Jesus. He started with Moses and the prophets. He said, let me show you what God's been up to since the beginning of time. 
Uh, let me show you what this is like. Like all this leads up to who I am. Now I think this is another important thing that we learn from this section is this, is that the best way to discover the truth of God and who and what he is up to is by searching his word. Church, we should know this by now. God's word is so important to us. It, he, these guys said when he was walking us through scripture, our hearts were burning. We knew something was going on. Like there was something happening. And you know what? The scripture even like says about itself, God's word is active. It's alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so God's word is so, so important to us. And they go, after they, Jesus appears and he, he leaves, they go back to Jerusalem where they find the other disciples and they utter these three words, it is true. It is true. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. It is true. See, the, this Emmaus road and ultimately this meal that these guys share with Jesus, it's all about perspective. Do you see how it, like it, it helps us to see the difference between living in Friday's defeat and Sunday's victory? They've been discouraged. They've been knocked down. They've been unsure where to turn. They left town. They're heading back home. But the resurrection changed everything. The resurrection changed everything, and so now they're up, and they're heading right back to that place of hope. See, some of you this morning, you're walking that difficult Emmaus road right now. But please understand what God has done for you. Please understand what the resurrection means and how the resurrection changes everything. I don't know if you remember the name Derek Redmond or not. Derek Redmond was a, uh, I bet you, but I bet you remember his story. Derek Redmond was a, a British Olympic runner. He was the... Uh, 400 meter gold medal favorite in uh, the 1992 uh, Summer Olympics in Barcelona. And during his uh, qualifying race, he pulled a hamstring about 150 minute meters in. His shot at Olympic glory was over. Nobody would have blamed Redmond for just simply walking off the track. Nobody would have blamed him for giving up, but nobody expected what he would do next. His injury, uh, after his injury, he got up and he started running the best that he could. And he was determined that he was going to finish the race. At times, all he could do was limp. The officials on the track, they tried to get him to quit. His pain was evident. Every step was a struggle. But he pressed on, determined to reach the finish line. Then out of nowhere, his father comes on to the track runs to his side, puts his arm around his son, and walks him to the finish line. One of the most inspirational moments in sports history. And when asked someone by someone uh, what, takes it, uh, what, what it takes to become successful, Derek said, just to get up one more time than you've been knocked down. He said, I, I could live with finishing eighth in the semifinal and getting knocked out, but I couldn't live with not finishing at all. And so he got up and he finished the race, and he did it with his father walking beside him with his arms around him the whole time. And I think it puts in perspective what the Christian life is all about. I, what our Heavenly Father is like, He never lets us run alone. Some of you, you're in the middle right now of a seven-mile journey. You've been knocked down by the mess of life. You're injured. You're wounded. You're feeling completely alone. You're not alone this morning. You're never alone. The resurrection has settled that. Jesus is alive, and he is with you today. See, so your heavenly Father, he walks beside you hand, uh, with his arm around you every step of the way, empowering you to do the very same thing. The, 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 in fact, Scripture tells us that the very, the, the very Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in believers today. What an incredible truth. Listen, it doesn't matter... It doesn't matter when you finish. It doesn't matter how you finish. It only matters that you finish and that you're finishing with your Heavenly Father. You know, in that final section that we read, Jesus appears to his disciples once again. He shares a meal with them. And, and after the meal, he, he again opens up their mind to the truth that they could see that all Scripture is pointing to Jesus over and over and over again. And then he ascends. He ascends into heaven. And at that point, Luke says these three words. Yeah. They worshiped him. They worshiped him. 
See, if, if the resurrection is true, and I have given my entire life for the fact that believing that the resurrection is true, if the resurrection is true, then Jesus is worthy of our worship. If the resurrection is true, that means that he is worthy of our all. Tim Keller says it like this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept what he said. If he rose from the dead, you've got to accept what he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And so did Jesus, like that's what we're left with, right? That's what we're left with today. It, it, it might seem like nonsense. You may have some questions. You may have some doubts. You, you may be, have dealt with some discouragement. You might have some questions and there's some things that are unanswered. It's really, really difficult. I get that. But if this is true, if, if, if this is true, right, he's worthy, he's worthy of our all. Listen, some of you today, like, you need to have a conversation with God. You, you need to, 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 to have a conversation with your Heavenly Father. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you've, you know, maybe you've gotten off track. Maybe you've been wondering. Maybe you're not where you need to be. Well, today, today, you need to have that conversation with your, with your Heavenly Father. For others, maybe you need to examine yourself and see exactly what you believe, you know. I, I, are, are you skeptical? Are you? Do you have doubts? You know, what, what is it for you? Uh, what is it for you today? He is risen. He is risen. Those three words change everything. And if that's true, then He is worthy of our all. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our obedience. He is worthy of our lives. Praise God for what He has done that we're able to celebrate on this day and every uh, on every. Uh, Lord's name. Would you, would you pray with me? Oh God, we're so grateful, Lord, for what you've done, what you continue to do in our lives, Lord. You're so, uh, Lord, just your coming demonstrates your, your great love for us, and we're so thankful. Father, we just pray that, uh, I just pray if there's any here or watching today, that Lord, if there's any uh, just way that you're working on their hearts that you would just motivate them and challenge them, encourage them, Lord. Maybe it's a turning from their sin, trusting you, Lord. Or maybe there's someone here watching that's never placed their faith in Christ, Lord. We pray that that would happen today. God, we, uh, we just praise you. We, we give you our all. And we just, uh, we're so thankful. So thankful for what you've done. Lord, we, uh, we praise you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have an opportunity to actually worship God and show Him our, to give Him our worth and to give Him our praise. If, if you have a decision that you, that you want to make, you're welcome to come forward at this time for prayer. Whatever. Some of you maybe just want to come up, come forward for just prayer this morning. Maybe just even on your own, just to, uh, just to, just to kneel down and pray, just to spend some time with, with your Heavenly Father. You're able to do that. Let's be standing and we'll sing.